Good morning. So, the topic of power has come up already as a theme this morning. So, Jackie talked about moving from positional power to relational power inside organizations. And Yoss's talk was just full of uh, nurses with the power to run their own operations. So, we know that this is a big topic. And so, we're going to have a bit of a, a discussion around this now. So, we've got four panelists for you. I'm going to each introduce each one in turn. They'll come up, they'll talk for two or three minutes to, to state their position, what they think about where power belongs in the future of the organization. And then we'll have a good old argument, I mean, a dialogue. Dialogue, yes, that's what we're looking for. So please could we have my first panellist, please, which is Jack Hubbard from one of Brighton's best-loved, well-known businesses, PropellerNet. Please give a large round of applause for Jack. Good morning, good morning, uh, good morning everyone. Can I say how chuffed I am to be at meeting today and big ups to the meeting team for flying the flag for positive change long before anyone else was doing this and inspiring me and a generation of Brightonian business Jedi's to be moving ahead and right, helping us to write our story and it's really much inspired me to be doing what I'm doing. So thank you, big ups. So where does the power belong in an organisation? I've thought about this at length and I've really been reflecting on my personal experience and I'm not really sure that ownership and power necessarily go hand in hand. I see it like this. Company, a company, an organisation, it's not a building, it's not a service or a product or a spreadsheet or a brand name. A company is a group of people that are bound together by ideas and by energy. So you've got founders, employees, customers, and of course their families uh, and their friends, an ecosphere, an extended ecosphere of human lives that are bound together by ideas and by energy. And if the main idea is money, which it so often is, then the energy can be really bad because you have greedy founders, mercenary employees, uh, and hard-nosed customers, which gives you an eternal conflict and creates a culture bound by fear, um, which is destructive and unstoppable. But if the main idea is, um, is all about positive change, then the en energy can be good. Um, we get beyond hierarchy and politics because we're all driven by the same outcome. Um, and inspiration will flow along with a spirit of collaboration. Um, and you can have a culture of love, which is um, collaborative, uh, creative, and unstoppable. Uh, so employees, the people they care about, their families, their friends, real, real people with real lives, um, if the core idea is to make a difference and make life better for these people, um, to bring happiness uh, and help them move in the directions of their dreams, then more power to the organisation and everyone within its ecosystem. We started propelling that in 2003 with two founders. Uh, we now have uh, 13 uh, shareholders, and that number grows every year. And I'm very much in favour of employee ownership, and I'm very much against uh, publicly traded company stocks. But I think that there is much more to power than employee ownership. Um, a propelling that our values of fun, well-being, adventure, creativity and innovation and our purpose is to make life better for our people. My role as a CEO is to pay attention to the dreams of my employees and constantly seek opportunities to make life better for them in ways that reflect those values. I don't pitch clients, I don't manage the finances or the legal, I leave the products and services other people and trust them, other people more capable, and I focus 100% on my time of dreaming up ways to make life better and move my people in the direction of their dreams. Nearly finished. Uh, so it's a free world, right, and everyone has a choice. The customers and the employees of a company have the power to leave and go elsewhere at any time if they're not feeling the love for what they do, and they will do that regardless of whether or not they own shares or not. So the real power for me lies in how much love everyone is feeling for the company. The challenge is therefore, how can you design an organization so that the company feels as much love for its people as possible, because that's reciprocated. So enabling dreams, in my experience, is way more powerful than employee ownership as, uh, as an idea to bring positive energy into a company. I can also imagine how attractive uh, the idea of an employee-owned cooperative must look to employers who work in a toxic money-led culture, but it's less important if the majority shareholders of a company um, are more like Willy Wonka than, Ad uh, than Alan Sugar. Um, so people are not machines, we're not to be motivated by blanket policy incentives, we are unique human beings, we each have a unique set of beliefs, um, experiences, hopes and dreams. So I think it's about paying attention to the individual uh, creative potential in every person and bring as much of that into the business as possible because this will give a true sense of ownership and that's where the true power comes from. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. So it sounds like we should probably hear from an employee ownership expert, what do you think? So it just so happens that we have one of the UK's leading experts in employee ownership. So could you please give a warm round of applause for Carol Leslie.
Wow. Hello, meeting. Can't believe this is my first meeting conference and I'll definitely be back. Tom, you're going to get your wish. You're going to have the first argument of the day. I do think that power and control is inextricably linked up with ownership. I would say that uh, the inequality in our society really comes from the fact that ownership is concentrated in the hands of too few. And when I talk about ownership, that's not just employee ownership, that's employee ownership of our land, of our public services, of our education, of our banks, of uh, our housing. It's, it's, to me, ownership is fundamentally the, what's at the bedrock of it, our society and the way that we work. If we, uh, and, and in organisations, where it's very much about shareholder value, with these shareholders being external to the organisation. What, what is their driver? It tends to be financial. And it's the external shareholder model that's eroding the rights of employees. Employees now have got far fewer rights than what they had even 20 years ago. What if we can turn all this in our head? And rather than being in a society where capital controls labour, what if we could turn it round so that labour really controls capital? What if the people that work inside organisations actually own these organisations? As Tom said, that's my area. It's about employee ownership. I help organisations. I, I help organisations generally own or manage their family businesses become owned by their employees. Once they are employee owned, I then work with them to get that ownership culture. So you're quite right. It's not just about the ownership. It's about how you do things as well. But what I would say is a sense of ownership is like a sense of lunch. You can't have a sense of lunch unless you actually eat it. You can't have a sense of ownership unless you actually own the business. So it's a tremendously powerful model, tremendously powerful model. It, there's, it should be no surprise that employee, and, and this is research that goes back the last, you know, for the last 10 years, there's studies coming out every year, employee-owned businesses in comparison with traditionally structured organisations are more productive. Different studies will put that figure at 4.5 to 19%, huge, when productivity in the UK is falling. Employee-owned companies tend to be more profitable. They have done better during times of recession. They tend to be much more innovative in traditionally structured businesses. Employees in employee-owned companies are happier. They are healthier. They live longer. And um, there was a study just released by the Chartered Management Institute. So it's not an employee-owned deal. You know, it's a complete mainstream organization that found that um, the value system of employee in employee-owned companies, people scored higher for the values of fairness, trust, excellence, humility, and courage. 90% of people who work in employee-owned companies describe their leaders as visionary, democratic, co a coaching leadership style, and 42% of employees in non-employee-owned companies describe their leaders as poor or from a, with a com command and control management style. Now, I can't say that an employee-owned company is a panacea, it's perfect, it's an ideal world. Of course it's not, there's, there's, there's lots of issues dealing with people, there always is. But what we do need to look at is how can we get more plural models of organisations and employee ownership very much is a force for that prove, improves the situation for individuals, for business, for society and for the community and the economy. So I do think it's about ownership. So let's hear from somebody else who is a, a co-founder of a, of, a, of a fairly large privately owned business, um, but they've also won huge numbers of, of awards and have some incredibly interesting progressive business practices. So here to tell you a little bit more um, about that, we have Kevin McCoy from Next Jump. Thank you, Kevin. Round of applause, please. And so first off, uh, a big thank you for inviting me. Uh, this, is, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I'll give you 20 seconds about Next Jump, and then I'll give you my opinion on, on, on the matter at hand. So Next Jump's been around for 21 years. Uh, we aggregate the buying power of over 100,000 corporations worldwide, including 70% of the Fortune 1000. And really, traditionally, we've had a, a product that uh, helps employees save money. And really, uh, relational to today's topic, uh, we now have a platform that helps companies build a stronger corporate culture. So where does power lie? I would have to agree that power lies with employees. But I, but, but I feel like the ecosystem goes far beyond just employees, and, and, the, and, and a focus on ownership is the wrong way to go. Uh, if you focus on the ecosystem, it's employees first who are then the predominant creators of value, going to customers, and then going to uh, ultimately shareholders. But then overall, the fourth piece of that 
is the community and the suppliers and the partners that any company works with. And I feel like any company doesn't work in a vacuum. And so looking at all four of those key stakeholders is absolutely critical. So two uh, major points underneath that. Um, first of all, uh, I feel like if we look historically at the lens of where assets lie in a company, you had the agriculture economy where land was the primary asset. You had the 19th and 20th century where machines were the primary asset, but 21st century employees are the primary asset for a company. But I feel like most companies are operating still in that machine era. And that's really where the problem is, and that's where this tension is that we, that we feel today. And I ho hopefully the debate will, will bring some of that out. And, and, and really, for, from, from my perspective, uh, it, it's, it's all about bringing those stakeholders together and, uh, and delivering value across all four of them. So, thank you. And so our fourth and final panelist today, we have another expert in all kinds of alternative ownership models, uh, from football clubs that are owned by their fans to community-owned pubs and uh, public facilities. So would you please welcome to the stage Dave Boyle. Um, I thought I'd do this as a piece of performance poetry. <laughs> no, actually bollocks, I'm completely useless at poetry. Um, <laughs> It's just my notes, folks. Uh, so for some of you, that would be a great relief. Um, so my first uh, story about me is I'm, I'm very oversensitive about power. And this comes from working in a, in a place where the sharp end of power and ownership, the savage interface betwixt them. Um, as Tom mentioned about football clubs, I used to spend a lot of time helping football fans try and get involved in the ownership, management, governance of their football clubs. And these are basically the last of the robber barons. They've bought these things because they want to have fun and they don't want to share the fun with anybody. Um, and there was one group we were working with in Scotland and they went to meet their chairman, had a good discussion about the quality of the tea, quality of the toilets, quality of the football. And eventually they say to the chairman, so we've had a really good meeting. It's the first time we've ever had one of these consultative meetings. What are the action points? What are the next steps? And the chairman says, Look, lads, I don't want to be rude, but it's like this. I own the club. Fuck off. And that's when it hits you. Ownership and power do have a bit of a relationship with each other. Um, and I used to see this all the time, not just in Scotland and small clubs, but all over the place. So I think I'm a little bit oversensitive to it, and that sort of colours my remarks. So three th quick things I want to throw out. Where should power lie in the 21st century or in the organisation of the future? It should lie in the open um, I'm a massive influence by Joe Freeman's work on the tyranny of structurelessness, that those who think power has been innovated out or has been smoothed out through some kind of structure are basically being duped by power. Power inheres to our human relationships, and some structures are better at bringing out a greater equality of access to that power, and some aren't. It's been a 3,000, 6,000-year-old story. The Celts used to kill their king after seven years because they knew what power did to them. Um, most of human history has been about dealing with the issue of how do we make decisions and deal with the fact that if we make one or two people allowed to make decisions, they have a tendency to go bonkers with that power. And, you know, civilization has been uh, riffing on this and maybe we can innovate our way through these but I kind of think we're standing on the shoulders of giants and there are only some ways to skin a cat and one of those ways to skin it is that it is bloody messy you either take power and responsibility however time consuming ball aching and, and frustrating that might be or you say I'm going to be a bit of a child and there is a parent above me who's going to make these decisions and mostly when it's things like making my tea, washing my clothes taking me to football matches great, I don't mind not having much power. When it's go to your bedroom, you're not allowed to go out wearing that kind of stuff. Then you kind of resent that kind of power. And there's really only one way. You can either be an adult or you can be a child in these kind of things. Um, and the final thing I'll just say is that there's a, I think there is a dissonance between a sort of fluidity of networked understandings of power. That power does inhere between us. We all have some power and some authority. But in the legal structures, which certainly in the UK we operate to, um, somebody's name is above the door. Somebody has the ability to make the biggest choice of all, which is to say, what's this organisation for? 
and how does that relate to my interests and our interests and society's interests, I could close the damn thing down because I own the shares. And there is a dissonance at some point between these two things, and anybody who thinks that ultimately this, this dissonance can be kept away from you, and it won't ever be a problem, I think is engaging in a bit of wishful thinking. It probably, hopefully, won't come around in this decade, but at some stage there will be a radical disjuncture between the sense of power people might feel and their lack of actual ability to exercise that power on a formal level, maybe when the company gets sold to somebody who promises to be dead nice, but probably won't be. And those kinds of decisions eventually always come to get you. So I'm a skeptic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. So, we've got a little bit of sorting out to do here. So, I'd first of all like to hear from, from you, Kevin. Um, so, there's been a little bit of a challenge to the idea of ownership that's not um, wholly democratic. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about how power can be um, manifested inside an organization when, when the ownership isn't democratic? Yeah, absolutely. And um, really, I'll, I'll make three points around that. Uh, and um, the, I'm going to use NextJump as an example. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, think of where the sort of policies, processes, procedures come from in terms of like how power is used in an organization that's typically in a human resources department. So with NextJump, what we've done is we've actually eliminated our human resources department. There, is, there isn't one at the company, and it's, and it's really everyone's responsibility. So to your point about sort of coming home and, uh, and who's, who, who, you know, okay, I'm the breadwinner, uh, my wife's the breadwinner, uh, but the chores still need to get done. Everybody needs to contribute. So if you eliminate HR as, as a function and you make everyone responsible for it, that sort of deepens the empowerment of employees. So, so that's, the, that's, that's the first point. So for example, our head of marketing is also our head of recruitment. And so that goes for recruitment, onboarding, our CSR initiatives, uh, our performance evaluations. Those are all run by everyday business leaders who are, who, who are within the company. Uh, the second uh, example within NextJump is we actually have a democratically elected leadership team. So each year, uh, the, the company votes on who, who's in the leadership team. And it's 21 people, it's called the MV21. It's uh, based on this uh, island off the coast of Massachusetts called Martha's Vineyard. And the house that we have our leadership offsite just happens to sleep 21 people. So that's how many people we have on the leadership team. And, uh, and so the, the, this group is elected every year. And as a founder of the organization, I've actually been voted off of that team once or twice and, and had to cycle back. But I mean, really, the criteria people, uh, people have in terms, of, um, in, in terms of how they're voting, it's are you growing yourself personally? Uh, are you contributing uh, to the revenue of the organization? And are you contributing back to the culture of the organization? So those are the three criteria people have. So that, and then the third point around how to uh, empower employees further, something that we're doing at Next Jump is we have a no fire policy. So uh, it came into place in 2012, and really the idea was that you would create a circle of safety for employees so that they can take risks, so that they can show vulnerability at work, uh, and so that you know, kind of bringing people into the family of the organization uh, becomes much more of a challenge because really uh, when, um, when, when someone wants to hire a, a new person, they're not thinking about, okay, if this person works out or doesn't work out in the short run, uh, it doesn't really matter. It actually matters deeply because guess what? That person's coming to Christmas every year for the rest of your life. So. Thank you. Uh, Jack, is there anything that you'd like to, to add to that about how we can have a sense of, of power without the ownership being democratic? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so um, when we were growing our business, the story was you needed to get three years of consecutive growth and then you could sell your company to a large corporate and then take your money and go and do what you wanted after that, and it felt like it would be selling out everything that we were all about. So I think um, I found a different way of doing things. Um, when, you, when you do that, you recruit a management team and you kind of make yourself redundant, so you need to find another job for yourself, otherwise you go mad, you just have to go and hide somewhere, pretend that that 10 years never happened. Um, so um, what you need to do is find a different way, and I think it's really important that these different ways of, um, of, of, of working are um, 
So I think you don't sell. It's really important that like independent companies do not sell to PLCs and become public trading. We need trading. We need to remain independent. What we do is we um, we uh, look for promise among our employees. We've got long-standing employees, been with us for five or ten years, and they've got ideas that are burning with inside them to follow their dreams. And we invest in them, and we invest in their dreams. And there's a number of spin-off initiatives that are growing now outside of the main agency, which we're investing in um, to get behind people's dreams. So is that we're actually using the resources, not just the financial resources, but the, the network and the connection and the skills within the company um, to, 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 to incubate and invest in these new initiatives. So I believe that in the future, and Brighton's a great place for this, um, that there can be a, a, a big group of independent companies that the aim is not to sell. The aim is to develop, you know, to, to generate profit in order to remain independent and keep going on this journey. Um, and um, that, I think, is, uh, that I, think is a powerful, that I think is a powerful idea. When it's all about advancing positive change um, and getting behind the dreams of people who want to do amazing things in the world, as opposed to the mandate for the company being, let's make as much profit as possible so that the shareholders can suck that value out of the company. That's, that's not good, but just going to employee ownership doesn't necessarily mean you're going to accelerate on that journey more quickly. Um, yeah, we, we, we're, we're always exploring employee, we're always exploring like a million things, and employee ownership is always coming up, and we're always moving along that journey. Um, but um, I just think it's, um, it's, just one, it's just one tool in the bag. Thank you, Jack. So I'd like to ask you, Carol, um, it sounds like we've got some great independent businesses with leaders and owners who are driven to create positive change in the world, some you know, radically progressive practices like not firing anybody ever, which is just extraordinary. Um, and having an elected management team. You know, are you buying it? Is this good, is this good enough? I think that's fabulous. But I'd ask the question, what happens next? What happens when the owner of that company wants to exit, realise the value, move on and do something else? And that, to me, is the crunch point. Before I talk about that, can I just say, what, just what sums it up to me is a very good friend of mine and one of the, you know, the leading global thinkers on employee ownership, David Erdl, Converted his family business to employee ownership back in the 80s, so one of the first um, organisations to do this. And he puts it really well. He, he, he went to Harvard and he just asked himself the question, why am I here learning how to be a better manager so I can make the employees make my family richer and fatter? And that's what it came down to. It's like, why are you doing it? And that's why I think ownership's integral to this. Now, we're... For me, it's about succession. I'm quite surprised that Jack says that, you know, he thinks about employee ownership then seems to put it to the side because what employee ownership would do, it gives him a vehicle for the company to go on for the long term. And that's where the sustainability comes on because this is not about individual employees holding the shares. This is mainly about collective ownership. So usually in an employee-owned company, it's structured that more than 50% of the shares are held in a trust. That trust goes on forever. So there's never a need to look at succession again and the company will go on and it, that protects the independence for the long term, not just while the current owner thinks it's a good thing. And for that, that's tremendous security, tremendously liberating for the employees. So I, I think employee ownership for me is, maybe I'm blind, but I just can't see how it doesn't work. Thank you. So Dave, anything you'd like to add? I expect there is. Um, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> the thing to say is there's, there's a, there is a, a disconnect, I think, between essentially this audience, you're here because you're moving into post-materialism. You know there's more to life than money. There are shitloads of people in this world, in this country, in this city, for whom the idea that they have a choice economically about where they work is just frankly bollocks. Um, they have no choice. They have no freedom to tell the boss to fuck off because the boss will sack them. They're on a zero-hours contract and they will not get another job and their family will, be, will not have food. And it's kind of, there's a, there's, the power can belong in an organisation of mindful people in the future in interesting ways. You can, but the power in most organisations is increasingly dictatorial, increasingly based on, you know, who cares what the ownership actually is. The single fact of the matter is, I don't have very much money and I need this and I'm desperate. And desperate is, you can never be powerful if you're desperate until you get so desperate that you don't give a shit anymore. And at that point, that's when the tinder boxes come out and the pitchforks. Pitchforks, wow. <laughs> so perhaps part of the, the, the crux of this particular issue is that what happens if you change your mind? So it's, it's, all, it's all well and good while the leaders today believe in all of this stuff um, and they have a, a positive intent, but what happens if they do sell it or if they change their minds or they go rogue and go a bit crazy and, um, and start to make different decisions? Can, can all of this good progressive stuff be protected? Without, without ownership. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, so I mean, my feeling is, I think, I think in the questionnaire there was this question of charismatic leader versus um, 
versus not. And, and it kind of comes down to, I mean, what you're talking about is the founder and like what happens when the founder wants to move on or you know, what happens when the management isn't sort of in sync with, with, with where the employees want to be. And you know, if I could answer that question as, as, as kind of part of the answer to this, is I think in the beginning stages of any company, there is a necessity for a leader to uh, kind of cultivate and grow a culture and a mission and, and an objective for the company and to defend it, quite frankly, from all of the parts of the ecosystem that I talked about. So that, that's skeptical employees, that's skeptical suppliers, that's skeptical community, that's skeptical shareholders. I think in the beginning, creating that vision and creating something uh, is, is absolutely necessary. To, it's almost like a force of will. But in the long term, to, to the point that was just made, that's completely unsustainable. And I think the only way to sustain that is through investment in culture. And by culture, what I mean isn't uh, sort of free games or, uh, or paint on the walls or anything like that. I mean, it's, it, it needs to be a philosophy behind how you grow people and then, you, and, and then they service the customers and the community. Uh, so we call that at Next Jump, better me plus better you equals better us. So be better me is investing in yourself so that you're uh, kind of unlocking yourself and growing to the next level. Uh, better you is where the, where the community and the customers and, and others benefit, and then better us encapsulates all of it. So I, I guess my, my main point is that in the long run, uh, you need to create a sustain sustainable system that self-perpetuates. So in our, in our example, yes, our founder and CEO did uh, found the company, and he, and he had radical ideas about investing in culture, about providing healthcare, uh, gym, gym memberships to all employees, about uh, about uh, cr creating programs that like like the no fire policy, but. He understands that that can't ha can't be sustained in the long run. So now what he's doing, similar to to what you're doing, is he he doesn't lead the company at all anymore. He he, he and the chief of staff actually coach the team of people that are actually running the business. And I think that's how you perpetuate it. That's how it grows. Where where uh, the original leaders aren't necessarily the ones carrying on with the mission continually. They have to push that down into into the other echelons of the company. So I'm just going to ask you really specifically. So the, the examples of the progressive practices that you gave, like the elected uh, leadership team and the, no, and the no firing policy, ultimately, who has the power to change those policies? Well, ultimately, uh, the, the employees have grown so into, like it's become such a, a, a part of the culture that I think that there would be a, an employee rebellion if anything like that were to change. And, and, but it takes time for that to seed because those are, you know, I mean, five or 10 years ago when we started those, those were kind of semi-radical ideas, but now they become such a part of the ingrained in everyone's life and every new person that comes into the company is sort of indoctrinated into this. I, I don't think it could change, not at Next Jump. So, so, Dave, what do you think about this idea that, yes, in theory, if the ownership isn't, isn't democratic, um, then the policies can be, can be changed? But actually, particularly in organizations where there's lots of creative, creative people, people who have a choice about where they work, in practice, they do hold a huge amount of informal power, aside yeah. from anything that's written on, on paper. Absolutely. I mean, culture eats structure for breakfast. And if you've got a culture which is based on participation, on respect for the people and their, their talents, that this is where the real value lies. And we, you know, it's the Gabe Newton sort of approach at Valve, he can't tell people how to make better computer games than the people he's already hired to make great computer games. And why would he get in the way of them? That would just be stupid. But, um, and that kind of culture can work very well, I think, in sort of knowledge sectors, where, which, you know, yes, increasingly the economy's moving in that direction. But um, I think it's, there's, a, there's a kind of wishful, there's a, there's a Mobius strip between these two, and they can't be escaped. Um, that you can't put off the evil day where things suddenly change. So there may well be a rebellion. It's more likely that always happens, you know, Star Wars is coming out. The rebellion, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Palpatine took years to move the Republic <laughs> towards uh, the Empire um, using terrible democratic structures and corruption and stuff. You know, the, and as Amidala said, this is how democracy ends, with a round of applause. Um, so so these, things, these things can go backwards. And there's, there's a, a, a kind of, there's two sort of flaws, I think, with this, which is uh, one is the kind of Whig view of history, 
that we're always getting better. And you know, before we used to be told what to do, and now we tell ourselves what to do and work with. It. And you know, cabaret, things can get worse. Um, and so these things cannot be relied upon to inhere forever. Um, and I forgot my second point, so I move on to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Carol, I want to put it to you that is there room for both? That it's great to have democratic ownership, but also there are models and it can be successful if someone has an idea that they want to, to bring into the world, to be able to retain ownership of that, to make sure that it actually happens and voluntarily recruit people in to help them to do that. So is there, is there room for both or do you really think that we have to have everything under democratic ownership? No. There's room for both, but it's maybe more of a kind of stages. So you have your entrepreneur who has the idea, who comes in and he sets up the company, and, and usually it's he, isn't it? And, um, and, it, and it grows from there. But what ha that, that, to me, it's but what happens when they want to move on? And much of this kind of um, the involvement and the engagement and employees have got the power of this and the power of that, they haven't really got the power, have they? They're permitted to have the power as long as the person in control allows them to have it. It's not real. In an employee-owned company, the leaders are accountable to the people that work for them. There's no hiding place. You can't, you know, you can't fool people that can see the order book isn't full, that can see that the quality is not there, they, can, they, they know the customers aren't happy. And there seems to be a real fear that, that this thing that we had this conversation last night, to be honest, that people need led and people need managed. And actually, it's like what Yoss was saying this morning, like nurses do not go out to work thinking they're going to create harm and create havoc. People want to do a good job and they will find different ways to do that. So for me, it, is, it, it does come back that ownership will become important at some stage because people shouldn't have to be going to work relying on being allowed to do a good job. They should be able to do a good job because it's their job, it's their company, they benefit when it goes well. Thank you. So, Jack, um, is it kind of like that you're a benevolent dictator who says, you know, trust, trust me, just, you know, trust Absolutely. me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the right thing, I'm not, I'm not going to sell out the company, and, you know, and you've earned that trust through your, through your behaviour, but how can we guarantee that that trust will, will, will be maintained forever? Trust me, it will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so looking at the big picture, right, because we're all here because we want to improve the world in our lifetime, we want to provide a better world for our children, we all have this kind of spirit of stewardship within us. And um, if you talk about going down an employee-owned route, companies like my company aren't the problem. Companies that are the problem are the people that have the money-led culture. Um, those are the toxic cultures that are the real problem, and there's more of those out there than there are of us. And it's common knowledge, because I've been told a number of times, going down the employee-owned route isn't the most like, lucrative way of doing it, but there are all these other benefits, at which point those guys have switched off. Um, so I, 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 don't think, you know, I don't think that's the solution. I don't think that's the solution. The solution is not you know, running with pitchforks at Tesco's, because they'll just shut the doors, call the police, and it's all over. The solution is to do what people like Ruth and Amy are doing, um, and reinvent the next Tesco's and just disrupt, just disrupt those marketplaces. We, I don't think we're going to overthrow these companies. The, this is why I'm against PLCs. This is why I'm against, this is why I'm so for um, independent ownership because then you have the control to go and take on these cultures and replace them. And I'm, I'm confident that's going to happen over the next 20 years. But, you know, pitch, pitching employee ownership to, uh, to, 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 to money-led cultures is, um, I think, could be a huge waste of energy. I think we should just go about usurping them and replacing them with better versions um, which are um, employee-owned and driven by positive change. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to change the tack a little bit away from who owns the organisation on, on paper and think about within the organisation how we can make sure that the representation of power amongst all groups. So um, I'm thinking specifically about um, gender equality or inequality. How can we make sure that everyone, regardless of their background, their colour of skin, their gender, um, has an equal shot at power? Um, is that one that you'd like to, to take, Kevin? Sure, but can I just go back to the previous topic for <laughs> go on, very quickly. one second? I just, I just want to point out one object example that you know, we've been kind of circling around this idea of what happens when 51% you know, of the owners, the stockholders of a company want to uh, kind of change the way the company is run, right? It's the, this, is, this is the kind of underlying question that we were just debating. And, and I have to, to point to an example of this happening uh, just last year at a uh, mid-sized supermarket called Market Basket, uh, 90 stores in New England, 
Uh, and the fight was between uh, what was a concentrated amount of shareholders. There were 12 shareholders in total for this $3 billion company. And uh, the, the majority of the shareholders wanted to change, change the way the co corporation was run. They fired the CEO, much beloved CEO of the, of the company. And what happened afterwards was absolutely revolutionary and radical. And, and I feel like it's on the bleeding edge of where we're headed as, as a society where, the, where you said culture trumps structure. I'm saying that culture can also trump ownership. And, and, that's, and, and, and that's where the employee value and the employees uh, sort of owning that culture and perpetuating it uh, is, is really the example. So, uh, I mean, long story short, what happened with, uh, with the market basket example was uh, the, the, the employees basically got out the torches and the pitchforks and shut down the organization. Uh, they uh, didn't pay attention to what the two new CEOs, the people with the sign at the top of the door, were saying. Uh, they shut down the warehouses. Uh, and then something really radical happened. The customers of the organization started to pick it it, with with the with, with the owners and the, or excuse me with the uh, with the employees and then the suppliers got into the, got into the picture and the community got into the picture and it was just an, one example of how this could be what we look like ten years from now if if we continue to invest in company culture in employees first. Thank you. So I'd just like to come back to the, the question again about how we can make sure that, that, that power is manifested for everybody inside an organization, regardless of being in minority groups, regardless of gender, color. Um, Dave, would you like to take that one? Um, it's about being mindful of how power actually works. As, as I think, there's, there's just as people who are really wealthy and become successful, our survey after survey shows how utterly blind they are to the role of luck. Um, and it's always about their heroic, brilliant talent, which has made them <laughs> incredibly wealthy. And I think people with power are very blind to how it feels to those who don't have it as much. There is an asymmetry of perception. Um, so the first thing to do is to think about how, if you want to be mindful about how you create power structures within organisations, is to recognise that you know, they tend to be driven by the way they've been done before, which is to say privileged people who are good at talking in meetings and being persuasive. And this is not the only way in which... Um, meaning can be transferred, conversations can happen, and a company, I think, ultimately is a conversation between all, a lot of people, and there are different styles of conversation and communication, and most people who are in the democratic structures movement have been historically shite at coming up with interesting ways to have that conversation. Instead, it's, would you like to come to a meeting and listen to some white men who are much older than you sit at the top and tell you how it's going to be, and then you stick your hands up, and then you fuck off. And, and, and you know, yay, democracy. Um, and that's crap. And, and so being mindful of how different people relate to, to language, how different people relate to being asked to make their case in front of other people. Um, and it, it's not one size fits all. It's a, you know, and if you're trying to genuinely, you know, going back to that comment which was made by, about Simon Sinek, if you've got genuine collaboration, it shouldn't be possible to see who did it. I think if you've got genuine open power structures, it shouldn't be possible to say that that's the place where power happened. There is a proper network in that, and everybody feels to find a place within that. Thank you. Um, so, Carol, I mean, regardless of how an organisation is owned, it's still possible for there to be uh, structural or institutional inequality, um, unconscious biases that, um, that are making things more difficult for some groups than, than others. How do you think we can, we can tackle power inside organisations beyond ownership, but making sure it stretches to everybody? Dave said it really, it's about, it's about education and awareness and it's about making sure that the organisation is as democratic and as open as possible and being conscious about it all the time. It's, I, I think it's very difficult to legislate for diversity, it's very difficult to legislate for equality. You can create equality of opportunity through policies but actually people find ways to get around it. So uh, to me it, it's about the, inform the informal networks, it's, it's, it's constantly education and awareness. It's not an easy, not an easy one. Thank you. And Jack, anything you'd like to add? We've got two minutes left. Um, <laughs> Would any of Jack's employees in the audience like to, <laughs> <laughs> like to speak? Hi, guys. They're all lovely. Um, so I'm a, I'm, I am a fan of employee ownership, and I, I really do believe it's, um, we're, on a, we're on a course, and, and we'll... 
as some, we, we're in it for the long term. We're not, we're not looking to grow and, and, and get out. And, and we, and we want to have a, a whole lot of fun on that journey. And there's just more fun we can have being together as a company than there ever could if we all took some money and went our separate ways. So we're really here for the ride for the long term. And, and, and ultimately, that our, our, our destination that we want to get to is, is to be an employee-owned company. So I'm a, mass, I'm, not, I'm a massive advocate of that. But that's a journey that we're going to go on. But um, practical experiences of running a company day to day is there's a myriad of things going on. <laughs> and um, it's... Um, I don't, you know, sometimes we get sort of blinded by one idea which we think is going to be our, um, this is going to be the answer to all of our problems because we come to an event like this and we go home with that one idea and we say, everyone stop what you're doing, we're going to become an employee-owned company. <laughs> and um, and uh, do that. Uh, that, that's fine if it, if it fits and it works. But um, it's more nuanced than that and it's, um, it, can be quite dis it can be quite disruptive, which is why it's just, um, it, it, it has to come from within what feels right for you, what the people that are in power need to um, tune into what's really right, what they want to do, where they want to take the company and then look at all these things and assess how and when you use them to continue, continue on that journey. Um, because um, yeah, running, a, running a, a company is a, di a very dynamic thing. There's customers, employees, partners, um, legal, paperwork, pitches, um, alpine theme parks, um, all, all kind of, all, all manner of crazy um, things going on and, and, and it's just, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's the right, I, I think it's a, a much stronger way to go than, um, it's the right way to go. Selling out to, to publicly traded companies is just perpetuating this issue. Um, so it's, um, but it's a journey, I think, not, not a not a, um, uh, an initiative that you do and it's done. Thank you, Jack. And on that note, we have run out of time. Um, so it's down to you guys to make your, make your minds up. I'm certainly still pondering everything that I've, that I've heard. Um, it's a complex issue, I think. Um, so would you please give a massive round of applause to Jack, Carol, Kevin and Dave. Thank you very much. Well